Imagine being arrested because you own a Bible or finding that the government has suddenly closed down your church. Imagine being denied education or employment because you're a Christian or being thrown into prison just because you told someone about Jesus. Imagine being forced out of your home because of your faith or living in a country where there's absolutely no freedom of belief. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Yet this is the cost of faith for millions of Christians around the world. Every day, they pay this price with courage and hope. And these are the top five countries where their faith costs the most. Number five, Pakistan. In Pakistan, an estimated 700 Christian women and girls are abducted every year. Any Christian can find themselves accused of blasphemy and end up in jail or attacked by an angry mob. But even though churches have been bombed and attacked, Pakistani Christians continue to meet together and shine God's light. Number 4. Libya In the lawless state of Libya, militant Islamists attack Christians with impunity. Desperate Christian migrants have been killed or sold into slavery. Yet despite the danger, Libyans are still coming to Christ. Number 3. Somalia In Somalia, just being suspected of being a Christian can lead to instant execution. But brave Christians still gather in small groups, constantly changing the location of their meetings to avoid detection. Number 2. Afghanistan there are only a few thousand Christians in Afghanistan and they keep their faith hidden. Anyone known to follow Jesus can face violence from their family or tribe. But even here, people encounter Christ through radio programs or, miraculously, in dreams. Number 1. North Korea North Korea is number one for the 18th consecutive year. In this land, the leaders are worshipped as gods. Christians are viewed as enemies of the state. Some 50 to 70,000 Christians are imprisoned in labor camps. Hannah was sent to a North Korean labor camp because of her faith. I was praying with my eyes closed and the guard was beating me, saying, why are you trying to pray? Are you insane? As I prayed, I believed that other Christians would be praying for me. This is what I prayed to the Lord in prison. God, have mercy on us. Save my young children and my family. Let this prison become a church one day so that it can be a place of worship for you. I praise my beloved Jesus who answered my prayer and freed me from the handcuffs and opened the prison doors. Millions of courageous Christians are paying the cost of following Christ. Open Doors works with local church partners in over 60 countries around the world to provide long-term support and bring them hope. Our underground networks smuggle Bibles and literature, offer legal advice, train church leaders and other Christians, and provide vital practical aid. In North Korea, your support is keeping 60,000 believers alive with food, medicine and clothing. You can keep hope alive for your persecuted family. Join the secret network today and start bringing hope to Christians in the darkest, most dangerous places on earth. Thanks so much. Um, it's an interesting seeing those videos in contrast, seeing um, everything going on publicly with the noise and then this video of uh, the reality of life as a Christian in many of these countries. Um, I encourage you to find out more about the work of Open Doors and go on their website. They've got lots of great materials, how you can pray, how you can, how you can get involved um, and partner with them as they try and support um, our Christian family across the world. Um, and the reason we looked at that is because um, we're starting a new series today on uh, the book of First Peter which we're going to be um, digging into a little bit um, for a little while now. And, um, you know, 
it's, it's very difficult for those of us who live in, in, in countries where there's a considerable amount of freedom to imagine what it must be like. Um, even doing what we're doing right now um, would be dangerous in, in a lot of countries and not just those five. Um, it's two weeks now since the, the bombings in Sri Lanka and I think that uh, brought um, very, very real and onto our screens and back into our memories again the reality of the danger of gathering to worship Jesus that, that many Christians face. Um, and that's not even in the top five uh, of the most dangerous places to be a Christian. Um, so I think it's important if we're going to think about what it means to be a Christian, which hopefully you're here to do today, <laughs> whether you call yourself one or not, uh, that's what we're doing, to listen to the voices of those for whom it costs the most to follow Jesus, to, to listen with them, um, to read our scriptures with them. And so as we open up this, uh, this great letter in the New Testament and, and start to learn a little bit more about what God has to say to us from it, um, we're going to do so by, by remembering those people. Um, our brothers and sisters trying to rebuild their churches and rebuild their lives um, in Sri Lanka right now as they gather. No doubt they've got some decorating to do. They've got some rebuilding of the fabric of their buildings to do. And no doubt they continue to mourn even if they've dropped off our TV screens. Um, but also remembering um, those who have been persecuted for their beliefs right from the very start. Christianity was born in persecution. Um, one of its first preachers died in the street and was stoned for what he said. And so this, um, this red thread runs right through what it means to call ourselves Christians. And it's important to remember that. So, First Peter. Um, I think there's some Bibles. I don't know if they're going to be passed around, but if you've got one with you, we're going to have the text on the screen as well. Um, maybe you've got it on a phone, and I will trust that you're not on Facebook and you're actually reading the, reading the text, although I can never tell. Um, so if you are on Facebook, make it look like you're praying or something as you're doing that. And um, you'll want the text open in front of you because we're going to be looking quite closely. Um, if you're in one of the church Bibles, we're on page 916, right towards the back. Um, the first letter of Peter. And he wrote it, uh, a letter to Christians scattered around, um, not, not based in the major metropolises of, of Rome or Jerusalem, but scattered around in the provinces that make up what is today Turkey. And the provinces are all listed there at the beginning of the, beginning of the letter, and you can see those once you found it. Um, and we don't know for sure what it was like for them, but we are fairly certain that they were experiencing some degree of persecution. Now, for some, that may have been um, verbal abuse, mockery, um, general kind of um, exclusion socially from things that were going on. For some, that would have resulted in economic persecution, that people wouldn't do business with them because they were Christians. They wouldn't hire the, the, the Christian metal worker or the Christian leather worker. They wouldn't go to the Christian shop. Um, or they wouldn't allow the Christian to partake in business deals or whatever. So for some, it would have resulted in economic persecution and hardship as a result of that. For some, even physical abuse, whether from their neighbours or ultimately from the state. Um, the, the Emperor Nero was famous for being brutal with the Christians. There was a fire in Rome in AD 64, which um, many people think was Nero's fault. And he scapegoats the Christians for causing that fire and declares Christianity illegal. Having heard that story along the side, the, 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 alongside the, the video of the, the stories of Christians today, it, it, it bridges the gap a little, doesn't it, between the ancient world when this, when this letter was written and the contemporary world, the, li the life of Christians today. Christianity was punishable in some cases by death. If you refused to um, offer the appropriate worship and tribute to the gods and emperors of Rome, that could lead to your execution. So there was a range of experiences of what counts as persecution. Um, sometimes we can think that just because people are a little mean to us at work, that counts as persecution. And I think put it in context, uh, both with today and with the ancient world. And maybe it's good for us to listen to those who really are experiencing persecution. And that's not to belittle any, any difficulties we may have because we bear the name of Christ. But remembering that when we do so, we are actually in solidarity with those who, who risk their very lives when they open a Bible or when they, or when they pray. So their, their suffering, whatever their suffering was um, in these places in the first century, is a theme actually that runs through the whole of First Peter. You read the whole letter, and I encourage you to do so. It'll take you not very long at all, half an hour tops, to read the whole of the, the letter uh, that Peter writes to these, these churches. And, and you can see how he constantly brings what he's saying back to their, their lived experience of suffering. And faced with that suffering, he addresses a number of questions. What does it mean to be God's people? 
faced with that reality. And we're going to be tracking through that for a few weeks now in a series. We're going to look at what it means for God's people to be hopeful, what it means for them to be holy, chosen, humble, and persevering in the face of hardship. And we're kicking off today by talking a little bit about what it means to be a hopeful people. And so that's our series. And so this is our text for today. And I'm just going to read it. And if you'd like to read along with me, we're going to read the first uh, 12 verses of First Peter. And I'm going to try and do it while holding a microphone. So First Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. And the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Shall we pray as we look into the things that angels want to look into? Loving God, we come to you through your word now to listen. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Be with us by your spirit as we look into those things which even the angels shudder to hear. Amen. Peter's, I think, one of my favorite people in the Bible. Um, My middle name's Peter, and I don't know if my parents knew very much uh, about what I was going to be like when they named me. Um... But I, I, I feel a, something of an affinity. I don't know if you do. I don't know if there's any particular biblical character you kind of feel like, yeah, he's the guy I'm going to look out for in the new creation. We're going to hang out together. Um, Peter, I, I feel like a bit like Peter sometimes. Um, he rushed in without thinking quite a lot, shot his mouth off quite a few times, um, made a lot of rash decisions, and then regretted them later. Um, <laughs> he, he's, you can read about him in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark, which has a particular focus on Peter's life. He, he, he's a hilarious guy. He, he's, the, he's the first guy to jump in, literally, uh, in any situation. And so he gets himself into a lot of trouble, but he also experiences a lot of blessing as a result. He was very close to Jesus, one of Jesus' inner circle of, of, of three. And um, yeah, I just love watching him. You know, there he goes again. <laughs> Peter rushing off again. He actually seems to be quite an unstable guy. Like you never quite know what he's going to do next. And so it's hilarious when, obviously, <laughs> let me back up because this, this bit isn't hilarious. He's most well known, of course, for um, declaring that he would never abandon Jesus and then being the first to do so. Uh, the first sign of persecution, of threat from a, a young slave girl at a fire, not even the greatest of persecutions that was going to come their way. But at the first sign of challenge, he, having said how he would stand with Jesus, denies him famously three times. And so it's, 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 funny and wonderful when the resurrected Jesus reinstates Peter later on and calls this wobbly unstable man rock which is what Peter means he calls him rock I think Jesus would have had a smile on his face when he did that you know what wobbly Peter I'm going to call you rock and on this rock I'm going to build my church he says so the guy who was the most unstable becomes the bedrock for the for the church um if if 
that speaks to anybody today. If you feel like you're an unstable person, take some heart from Peter and what Jesus, Jesus can call you rock and build great things on you, no matter how wobbly you might feel you are in your faith. And so when Peter is writing this letter uh, later in his life uh, as the, the rock of the church to these um, wobbly churches in, in modern Turkey, experiencing threats, experiencing persecution, he's doing it from a place of lived experience. He knows what it's like to deny Jesus even from just the challenge of a, of a young girl by a fire. And they're going through a greater fire and a greater ordeal. But he knows what it's like to be challenged and to come up short. And so it's with a lot of personal compassion that he writes to these people. And, and he writes this very important message to them in his first, in his first letter, encouraging them to uh, learn about the grace of God, to know it, to stand fast in it, to be immovable in their faith in Jesus, even though they're going through these great, great trials, both human trials from the authorities and from their neighbors, and also behind all that, spiritual trials as the devil himself is seen as the architect of it all, prowling around seeking to devour them. And so because of that, it's it's an important message for all Christians, not just those experiencing persecution. We stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters across the world, in Sri Lanka and elsewhere today. But we also remember that this is God's word to us as well. Even though our trials may be nothing in comparison as we meet publicly now and as people run publicly through the streets bearing the name of Jesus, um, we celebrate that. We don't take it for granted. But this is a message for all of us because we all face threats and we all face persecutions of various sorts and challenges to our faith. He greets them. We saw that in the first verse. He calls them exiles. He says, Peter, to the exiles in the dispersion. Why does he call them exiles? People have been digging into these things for years, trying to figure out why he would call them exiles. Uh, There's a couple of options. There's all sorts of possibilities for why they're called exiles. Whether they are Jews or Christians, um, they're living outside of their homeland. That's what an exile is, right? They're a displaced people. They're migrants. They are refugees. They are not at home. They're exiles. That maybe these were the people that Nero kicked out of Rome following the fire. Maybe they are those who, just, who, who live outside of the homeland of, of Israel. And that's why they're called exiles. It's probably a social reality for many of them. Living as foreigners. Living in a country not their own. Feeling like they're not quite home. But, but also, and perhaps more importantly for Peter, it's a spiritual reality that applies to all Christians. That the world we live in is in a very important sense not not our home, that we are exiles. All of us are resident aliens. Our citizenship is elsewhere. And that doesn't mean we don't care about this place. We just saw lots of examples of how much we do care about this place, this community, this world. Of course, because it's God's world and God's community, and so we care about it. But we remember that this world is not ultimately our place of citizenship. Whatever they stamp on the passport, we, our citizenship is in heaven. And it's from there that we expect our Saviour and our Lord. And so we're all exiles, in a sense. We're all resident aliens. People with a settled status in the world as it is, but remembering that our true citizenship comes from somewhere else. Comes from where God lives, comes from heaven. And so he calls them exiles, and then he goes straight into reminding them of the basis of their faith in the Holy Trinity. In God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He reminds them that they're chosen and called by the Father. He reminds them that they're made holy, sanctified is the word we use. They're made holy by the work of the Holy Spirit among them. And that they live lives obedient to Jesus and sprinkled by his blood. Going to do an entire series just on the first two verses of this book. Don't worry, I'm not going to, but we could. (laughs) That wonderful, amazing reminder. Sometimes we skip over these opening parts of these letters as if they're just, hey, hey, how are you? But he roots everything he's about to say in the life that they live in God. We're not just people called. We're people called and sanctified. And we're not just people called and sanctified. We're called and sanctified and obedient to Jesus, the one whose blood has set us free as we just sang. That's what it means to be a Christian. To be one whose life is lived in God and in the power that comes from life in God. And so before he's even got going, he's already plumbed the depths of what it means to confess Christ and to worship the one true God. 
And then, in verse 3, he starts as we started, with worship. Um, I had so much fun studying these, these few verses, from verses 3 to 9. This opening doxology, this opening praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in the original Greek, this is one sentence. 114 words long. Yes, I counted them. 114 <laughs> words long without a pause. He launches into this breathless, unstopping praise to God. And that's how he begins his message, with praise. Not just as a going through the motions thing, but as a way of anchoring everything he's going to say about the Christian life, where it should be anchored, by turning your eyes Godwards. That's what worship is about. He doesn't ignore what they're going through. You heard that in the text. He talks about their trials. But he takes their trials and he situates them in praise. He takes their experiences of suffering and he places them in praise. That's why we get here. Even if you didn't feel like it this morning. Maybe you'd rather be running the 10K, I don't know. Even if you didn't feel like singing, you didn't feel like praising, even if you, you went through the motions, that's okay. If you're suffering so much that you don't feel like singing, sing anyway. Or stand in silence as we sing around you and place that suffering in praise by turning our eyes to God. That matters. That's why we do this. We, bring our, we don't leave our lives at the door and enter into a period of ignoring the real world, we bring the real world and we place it at God's feet in praise. It's not just about what it does for how it makes us feel. It's about changing our perspective on reality, recognizing that there is a God on the throne, even if it doesn't feel like it. And so Peter does the same. He launches in with praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they didn't feel like joining him in praise. It's all very well for you, Peter. It wasn't actually, but it's all very well for you, Peter. But we're going through Stuff that you can't imagine. It's all, you know, you singing your songs while we're suffering. And he's like, yeah, you sing your songs while you're suffering. It's a profoundly uh, profound theological statement that he begins with, as you, as you can see. Uh, all worship should be. Worship should never be empty of content. It should never be pure emotion. It should always be rooted in truth. And so is, so is Peter's as he praises the, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <sighs> wonderful, wonderful words. It's not escapist. It's not worship that ignores the world. It's not worship that gives us a temporary, otherworldly experience. It's worship that takes our world and then it allows it to be caught up into the heavenly perspective on our sufferings, on our experiences. And that's what hope's all about. That's what it means to be a hopeful people. Uh, being a hopeful people doesn't mean ignoring the world around us and smiling through it all. It means placing our experiences at the feet of the risen Lord Jesus and allowing that to change our perspective on the world that we live in. What does it mean then to be hopeful people? Well, we're going to say a few things, just three brief things about what that means. I didn't check my watch when I stood up. I'm going to go on instinct here. But before we do that, um, I, I had a little illustration that I've crossed out because I don't think we need it because we got a perfect illustration of what hope looks like in looking at that video of, of all the activities on the noise yesterday. You know, those weeds are going to grow back, don't you? Even if you pull them up really well. Anyone who's pulled up weeds, I don't pull up weeds. But people who pull up weeds, you, they come back, right? They have that habit. You know that the rubbish will be replaced by more rubbish. Someone will fly tip again. A big downer. I thought this was supposed to be a message about hope. You know it will though, right? So why do we do it? I mean, you know that graffiti will come back on that wall. Maybe even like tomorrow. If you, walk, if you painted a wall yesterday and you walk by in a couple of days and someone spray painted graffiti back on that wall that you painted, how are you going to feel? Frustrated? Upset? Upset? Hopeless? Why did we bother? Well, we bother because it's a sign of hope. We don't bother because it's effective. Anybody who's ever weeded knows that that's a pointless way of thinking about weeding, right? You don't weed because it works. <laughs> You weed because, I don't know, why do people weed? <laughs> you weed because it's part of what it means to tend the garden, right? It's not a permanent solution. It never is. A bird will come by and plant another weed for you. It's the nature of things. 
But it's part of what it means to tend that garden. You paint the wall because it's a sign of something. You clear the rubbish because you want to show a sign of God's love and of the hope that you have for the world that he loves. Right? You don't do it because it works. You do it because it means something. Because it's a sign of hope. And so when I see the noise and the cynical part of me says, yeah, all those weeds are coming back again. Yeah, that rubbish will be replaced. I'm missing the point when I think like that. Instead, I should look at the things that, that we did and that God's people did and say, there's some signs of hope. A demonstration of God's love in practical ways. A sign of the hope that we have and the hope that we want to share with a hopeless world. Whether it works or not. You know what? We'll paint the wall again next year. We'll pull the weeds up again next year. That's okay. We keep demonstrating signs of hope. Even in the face of all the evidence, we demonstrate signs of hope. It's what God's people do because it's what God does in and for us. So we keep pulling up the weeds. In my case, we start pulling up the weeds as a sign, a sign of hope. So what, is it, what does it mean to live as a hopeful people? I want to say three brief things from the text in front of us about what it means to be hopeful people. First, in the first couple of verses there, verses three to five, speaking of weeds, hope is rooted. Hope is rooted, and it's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Hope is not rooted in the evidence around us. Hope is not rooted in our positive feelings or the effectiveness of our witness or whether it worked yesterday when we cleared someone's garden. Hope is not rooted there. Hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's very significant that the bombings that took place in Sri Lanka were on Easter Sunday as God's people gathered to celebrate the resurrection from the dead. It's very powerful, very significant that that is what was going on. Because the proclamation of Jesus rising from the dead, which is what Easter is all about, and we're still in Easter, what Easter is all about is the, is the bedrock of our hope. If you're placing your hope on how effective Christianity is, how well it works, or how good it makes you feel, then you will, you'll get a rude awakening at some point. If you're here and you're not a Christian and you're trying to work out whether Christianity works or not, can I encourage you to to not look there but to keep going? It's not based on whether it works or not. It's based on the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. That is the bedrock of Christian hope. And it's a living hope. We just sang about that and thank you so much for singing that song. I was going to say, please please, can we sing this song and then you picked it anyway. Of course you did. A living hope. You see, our hope is not based only on something in the future, as important as that is. We don't hope just because there will be a resurrection. We hope because there has been a resurrection. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and therefore we hope. He is the basis of our hope. Leslie Newbegin, the great missionary and theologian, a missionary to India, one of the greatest Christian writers there is, said this, I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The event of Jesus rising from the dead is the basis of our hope. Not our optimism, not our pessimism, not the evidence of our eyes, but the the fact of Jesus' resurrection is the basis of the Christian hope. Our hope is rooted. Then verses 6 to 7 as we read on. It's a hope that will be tested. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Hope will be tested. Tested by fire, literally in some cases. Peter takes them to a a classic illustration of that, of the refining of metals. It's something we still do today. If you want to test the quality of gold, I wouldn't recommend you do this with your wedding ring, but if you want to test the quality of gold, a good way to do it is to to test it with fire. You you melt it. If you want to refine gold, if you pick a lump of gold out the ground, it'll probably be mixed with other things. If you want pure gold, 
you melt it. The other things burn away. It's not pleasant for the gold, but it refines it and it purifies it and it tests it and it strengthens it. And so faith, which is worth even more than gold, similarly goes through some melting sometimes. I don't know if that's where you are today. You feel like your faith is your faith. Your faith has, that's hard to say. Your faith has melted, or it's being heated. It's being tested. If that's where you are today, can I encourage you to say that that works? I'm not saying it makes it easier. And I'm not necessarily saying that that has to be coming from God. Peter doesn't go to the point of saying all, all persecution is actually God testing you. But what he does say is that that fire of testing is used by God and can result in the strengthening and purifying of our faith. It doesn't mean it's pleasant. It doesn't mean that we walk through it with a big smile on our face. But it does mean that it has meaning. That our testing can have, refine and strengthen our faith as gold is tested, as it goes, goes through fire. And that reality changes our perspective on what we're experiencing. My suffering isn't pointless. It'll be used by God. That doesn't mean that he made it up and gave it to me. But he will use it. And he will use it to refine and test me. It will change my perspective. It'll change the way I see the world. And this is what God does for us. By the power of his Holy Spirit, he he opens our eyes. We see life in color. We see life again differently because of what he is saying to us. Because when we listen to him, we don't just learn stuff. We learn to see differently. And that includes seeing our sufferings differently. Whatever you're going through, God can help you to see that differently. It doesn't take it away necessarily, but it changes your, your, your vision of it as something that can shape you and purify you and test you. Isn't that amazing that God can do that even with the most horrible things? He can turn them into something wonderful. He's, a, he's an expert at that. He brings diamonds from dust all the time. And he can do that for us too. In verses 8 and 9, we read this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, and maybe that speaks to one or two of us today, even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that faith isn't based on sight. It's not based on the evidence. It's the assurance of the things not seen. And that results in joy. Joy isn't keeping a fixed smile on your face when people ask you how you are. Oh, I'm fine. You know, Jesus is good, even though you're in pain. You can have joy and cry at the same time. You can have joy and curse God at the same time. You can have joy and experience the depths of depression. Because joy isn't happiness. Joy isn't the fake smile. Joy is much deeper and better than that because it's rooted in hope. Joy isn't about optimism. It's not about just putting a glass half full kind of perspective on things. Though you have not seen him, you love him. There's no evidence for their joy. They haven't seen what the salvation. Their friends been tortured, their friends been killed, their friends been reviled, their friends' business collapsed because of their faith. Where's God? Where is Jesus? Though you have not seen him, you love him. Because hope is rooted in something greater than what we can see, than the evidence or the proven facts of our eyes. We all know that proven facts can easily mislead anyway, right? Hope is based, therefore, in faith in Jesus. But it's not blind faith. It's not pie in the sky. It's not just, damn the evidence I'm going to believe anyway, keep smiling. That's not Christian hope either. It's rooted and tested and joyful because it's based on Jesus. Not on how we feel or what feels right or how optimistic we are about the world or otherwise. No, it's based on Jesus. It's based on a revelation that God has spoken to the world in Christ. Our hope is based in him. It's based in a person. 
That's what Christian hope is. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and so we have hope. We're a hopeful people because of that and that alone. Everything else will burn away. The only reason we get together and do this or clean up a garden or run in the street is because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. What a better time to do this than the bank holiday weekend after Easter. So we, Jesus is risen, so pull up some weeds. Jesus is risen, so paint a wall. Jesus is risen, so bounce on a castle because Jesus is risen. There's no other reason to do that. What a pointless thing a bouncy castle is. There's, it's got no value unless, unless there is hope in the world. And I watch kids bouncing on a castle. And I'm like, there's hope in the world. There's people bouncing. They're not doing anything. They're not producing anything except noise and bruises. But it's a sign of hope. Jesus is risen, so pull up some weeds. I'm not going to go and actually do that. This is, you know, this is a sermon. I don't actually do the things that I say. But maybe <laughs> there are some weeds in my front garden, and I'm feeling convicted by the Lord that I should go and pull them up today. Yeah, I better go on and do that. My front, front garden particularly is a bit of a state. And so we are people of hope, demonstrating signs of hope to a world that, let's face it, needs it. If you look around at the evidence, there's not much to be hopeful about. The scientists tell us we're already too late to save the world. And the news tell us that no matter what we do, violence continues. And it's easy to be hopeless if you just look at the evidence. But we don't look at the evidence. Well, the rather we do, but we place it in the context of the worship of the risen Jesus. And so we have hope. Because God can bring life from death and has done. And therefore will for us all. So whether you're in times of persecution or comfort, wherever you are, being a people of hope means being rooted in the resurrection of Jesus. It may and almost certainly will mean being tested by fire. But it means being joyful in and through that. Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. If you're up for that, that's called being a Christian. It's fun sometimes. It's hard sometimes. But it's real life. And it's living hope. Because he lives. Let's pray, shall we, as we come to the table to remember that he lives and to celebrate that hope that we have. Lord Jesus, our living hope, we praise you today. Even if we don't feel like it, even if our mind was wandering onto the things of the week, the pain of our jobs, the pain of our family lives, our health, the threats and challenges that surround us. And even as we place those in the context of the threats and challenges that surround our brothers and sisters across the world, we bring them all to the place of praise and we declare you, the risen Lord, to be our living hope. And you've called us to be a people of hope. May we share that hope with a hopeless world in all that we do this week. Amen.